And joining us now, the new leader of the Green Party of Ontario, there's Mike Schreiner. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Steve. Good to have Pleasure you here. To be on. Your first of uh, numerous visits, I'm sure. Uh, first question, how does a nice boy from small town Kansas end up the leader of the Green Party of Ontario? That's a great question. I moved here in the mid-90s for love and uh, fell in love with Ontario. And my wife and I decided to stay here, um, raise our kids here. I started a business here. And in about five, six years ago, started getting involved in politics. And I thought as a small businessman who was running a green business, the Green Party just seemed like a natural home for me. What kind of business? Um, I started a business that delivers uh, local food to customers all throughout the GTA. And I ran that business for about 10 years. And then about four years ago, I left that business and along with my colleague, Lori Stahlbrand, started a nonprofit organization called Local Food Plus that promotes local sustainable food systems. Gotcha. You are, I, I think, the first new leader of the Green Party in, is it 16 years? 16 years. And you are the first full-time leader That's as right. well. Why'd you want the job? You know what? I think the green message is more relevant now than it's ever been. And so I think Ontario, needs a political party that's going to promote a prosperous green economy, that's going to promote sustainable communities, that's going to talk about the health and well-being of all Ontarians. And I feel like the Green Party is that party, and I felt like the party would benefit by someone like myself who brings some skills and experiences in building businesses and building organizations, because I think that's one of the things that it's going to take is for us to build our capacity so we can deliver our message to, to Ontario. Let me ask the obvious question. Are you a Canadian citizen? Yes, I am. You are, okay. Absolutely. When did you get your citizenship? Um, about, oh, I think about five, six years ago now. Yeah. Okay. Here, we want to put up a chart here showing how the Green Party has done in Ontario elections since the mid-1980s, uh, mid mm -hmm. and show that your vote actually has grown substantially. If you go to 1985, yes. you had 0.1%, 87, less than 0.1%, 1990, 0 0.7, 95.4, 99, 0.7, still no breakthrough. 2003, that's Dalton McGuinty's first election, you get 2.8%. And then in 2007, I mean, a real breakthrough, 8%, no seats, but a bigger number to be sure. Now, I guess I don't mean this to sound like a smart-ass question, but you know this as well as anybody. The Greens have not elected a single person in any provincial legislature or federal parliament ever in the history mm -hmm. of this country. What makes you think that's going to change with you running the show here in Ontario? I think it's going to change because, like I said, I think our message is more relevant today than it's ever been. So we've doubled our vote in every election since 1995. Obviously, our first big start jumping through was in 2003, and that's actually when I started getting involved in the party. And um, I think we're poised now after our, our very strong showing in 2007 to do very well in 2011. And I think part of that is, is that people are starting to recognize that one of the reasons for this recession is $150 barrel oil. And it's becoming increasingly challenging for us to maintain prosperity in a high cost, high energy cost environment. And the Green Party for a long time now has been putting forward a clear and compelling vision of how we can restructure our economy to be prosperous in that type of an environment. And I think voters are going to respond to that. Okay, let me do a few more political questions here. Sure. How, what's the goal in terms of a seat count for the next election two years hence? Yep. There's, there's a few ridings, particularly in southwestern Ontario. So if you look at a riding like Bruce Gray Owen Sound, we, we were second. We pulled very strong in Guelph. We've done very well in Dufferin Caledon. So ridings along the Niagara Escarpment, southwestern Ontario, we've finished very well. We've done very well in downtown Toronto, downtown Ottawa, um, some ridings around the ring of Toronto. As a matter of fact, we have 18 ridings where we finished third or higher in, uh, since the 2007 election. Can and you win any of those? I think we can, yes. I hate to do a predictions right now because we can't, we don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of years, but I think this party will be in a position to elect Green MPPs in 2011. I mean, one of the reasons I ask, obviously, is that we had a referendum here a couple of years ago and it got voted down. Had it got voted up, we would have had a more proportional representation system mm -hmm. in place. You could have much more easily won seats then. In a first-past-the-post system, I mean, is it all but impossible for you guys to win a seat under those circumstances? I don't think it's impossible, but it's interesting that you raise that issue because when we talk to Green parties in Europe, and as you know, Greens have been elected in Europe and actually been a part of governing cabinets in Europe, and they look at a percentage like we received in Bruce Gray or in Sam where we received above 30% of the vote in the last election, and they're like, oh my gosh, a Green in Europe's never received that high of a percentage of the vote, yet we've been able to elect people. That being said, the voters of Ontario they voiced their opinion on proportional representation, 
And so the reality is, is we have to win in, in a first past the post system, and I think we'll be in a position to win in some writings in a first past the post it's system. It's a system, though, that really punishes third and fourth place parties and fifth place parties, you know? Well, I mean, it makes it challenging, for sure. Well, challenging is one way to look at it. I mean, <laughs> damn near impossible is another way, right? It's, uh, I, I can't remember the, well, I think in the last, uh, you know, 25 years there's been one person elected who's an independent, and otherwise mm -hmm. you've got to be one of the big right. two mostly, mm -hmm. or big three. Mm -hmm. I mean, is, mm -hmm. do, do you really see any possibility of winning a seat under this system? Well, look, look federally. You know, the Reform Party, Deb Gray was elected in 1992, and you could argue, you know, obviously the few changes have happened over the years, but you could argue that that party now forms the federal government. So it is possible for parties to break through and do well, and I think some of that's message, timing, building organizational capacity, and that's what we're really focused on with the Green Party right now. You have a premier today in Ontario who thinks of himself as being a very green guy. You know, he's building windmills all over the place. Uh, he's got a new Green Energy Act, which I think you agreed will significantly spur, I think were your words, investment in renewable energy. So do we really need a Green Party out there running candidates in all of the ridings when this guy, you know, is getting some attention for doing some decent things? Well, I think, you know, compliments where compliments are due. I think the Liberals have made some tentative good first steps with the Green Energy Act. My compliments to them. It's sad that it's taken this long because while we've been dithering, countries like Denmark and Germany and Spain are much further ahead of us and actually are doing, particularly Denmark, doing quite well in today's economic environment because they have embraced uh, a more green economy. But I think there's some other areas in, a, in addition to talking about green energy, which we're going to really promote hard and we're going to really promote it from a grassroots community power bottom up perspective which is slightly different than the way the current government is implementing it. And then the other thing is, is I think we need a party that recognizes the importance of small businesses, family farms, um, in the terms of building economic prosperity, sustainable communities. Well, that's interesting. And Let some me issues up. like that that I don't think the liberals are. I want to follow up on that because sure. I, th I think it's fair to say that there's an assumption out there that the Green Party is a very left-leaning party. Is that true? No, it's not true at all. We're a Where party, are you on the spectrum? You know, we're a party that likes to say there's good ideas on the left and there's good ideas on the right, and we take the best ideas and move forward. And, um, and, and we're really a party about pragmatism and sensible solutions, moving Ontario to a more sustainable footing. Let me talk about the number one issue in the provincial arena today in politics, and that is the new attempt to harmonize the sales taxes mm -hmm. federally and provincially. Uh, this is from your party platform. The ecology-friendly and economy-friendly alternative to the HST would be to untax consumption and services altogether and generate needed government revenue by charging fees on the use of resources like oil, trees, gravel, water, and land. Government revenue should come from the use and abuse of nature, not from the ingenuity and hard work of humans. So you want a green shift? Well, you know what I'm actually calling it is a green tax cut. And it's a very simple premise that if you live a green lifestyle, and I think mo many people are already leave, live, living a green lifestyle or want to. I mean, you pick up a magazine or the newspaper or anything and you see all kinds of ads for people going green or doing this and that, your taxes will go down. If you're a business that's investing in green technologies or producing green products and services, your taxes will go down. Now, obviously, we want to maintain government revenues. So we would lower business and income taxes, making people less expensive to employ, and I think arguably making our businesses more competitive in the marketplace. And we would tax things that we don't want in society, such as waste and pollution and unsustainable natural resource use, which I think is going to put us on a more sustainable financial uh, foundation because it's going to mean our businesses are going to be more efficient moving forward into the 21st century, and particularly in a 21st century with very high energy costs. And I want, us to, I want Ontario to build a prosperous green economy, and this is a really critical policy to okay. get us there. Mike, you know what? 14 months ago, Stéphane Dion was sitting in that very chair saying the exact same thing, and we know what the public rendered its verdict on that you know, green shift plan. He was saying the same thing. Tax bad behavior, tax, uh, you know, cut taxes for good behavior. Why do you think your pitching that proposal will have any more favor with the electorate than what he found. Because we're doing it in a different way. So I think he had a great idea that he just didn't know how to sell or how to implement. And part of it was is he focused all of his environmental taxes just on carbon. And we're looking at carbon as one element, but there's a other range of, of issues that you can tax as well. And I think the other important point is, is to really focus in on the fact that 
This is about lowering business and income taxes as well and making light labor less expensive to employ. And I, I think that was something that the federal liberals did not emphasize right. in their plan. Right. And, and so I think people saw it as a tax increase rather than, rather than a tax decrease or, a, or neutrality for some people. And really, in some ways, this gives people a choice. Like, if you're, if you're successful, you pay more taxes now, right? And in our plan, if you're successful, you're not necessarily going to pay more taxes. But if you live an unsustainable lifestyle, then that's a choice you've made. Hmm. The Green Party uh, likes to think of itself uh, as a bigger tent party mm -hmm. and, as a result, not a one-trick pony. Mm -hmm. uh, likes to think of itself as a party beyond the environment. So let's get into some of that. What else should we think? Well, let me put it this way. Education. Mm -hmm. In the last election, the Greens represented the viewpoint that the public school system and the Roman Catholic school system should be merged together in one. Mm -hmm. Is that still your position? That's still our position. Um, right now, the priority we're emphasizing in education is to empower local school boards, um, parents, and communities to make more decisions around education curriculum in our communities. One of the concerns we have is that we've seen a, we, we see an increasing centralization of educational decision making in the Ministry of Education's hands. We think we should be re-empowering local school boards. So that's, that's, the posi that's the issue in education we're really pushing right now because I think it's an important one, particularly with Bill 177 in front of the legislature. Okay, you, you do know 30% of the people in this province are Catholic, right? I do know that, do you absolutely. Are wor worrying about writing off all those votes if you're no, not we're in favor not. of a separate school As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm, meeting, I'm meeting with uh, Catholic school teachers. Um, I grew up Catholic myself. I think it's a conversation worth having because I think we can have a school system that um, accommodates the best of the public system and the Catholic system, and we can have space within that system that allows people of all faiths to have some time and space to... Um, practice their beliefs, whatever they may be. Our deficit's $24.7 billion. Mm -hmm. Some, I guess the Premier a few weeks ago, floated the trial balloon of having Dalton days, where mm -hmm. public servants are forced to take, whatever, 10 days off mm -hmm. work during the mm -hmm. course of the year, unpaid, save money. You in favor of that? No. Okay. In which case, how do you want to work on that deficit? Absolutely. So I think one of the issues we have to look at is, is we spent, a lot of that deficit was spent bailing out the old economy rather than investing in the new economy. So that's something we would do differently. I think uh, an important issue that we really have to start talking about, and I believe the Green Party is the only party really talking about this, is investing more in health prevention and health promotion. Our belief is, is that a penny saved today, or a penny invested, I'm sorry, in, in health promotion will save a dollar tomorrow. And as you know, health care almost represents almost half of our provincial budget. And so it's an area that we have to get costs under control and preventing illness in the first place is the best way to okay, do that. That's, that's, I mean, the, the a penny invested today is a dollar saved down the road uh, is a nice slogan, but I, have you actually got a study that says that's what the relationship is? Well, I mean, let's look at it this way. You know, we know that the leading cause of um, death right now among Ontarians is cancer and heart disease. We know that we have an obesity ep epidemic. We know that one in four children now suffer from asthma. So if we don't start looking at how do we prevent illness, we're going to see continuing increases in, in, in health care costs. And you know, you've seen studies by like um, the you know, health uh, uh, family physicians and things like this indicating that and putting numbers on that. You want to ban smoking? We're not saying you should ban smoking, but we certainly don't encourage smoking. We think the government's uh, made some very good strides in discouraging smoking. Let me ask you about organized labor, which of course is still influential at election time. They can, they can get people involved. They can be certainly helpful to uh, new Democratic Party candidates mm -hmm. in various ridings across the province. What kind of a relationship do the Greens have with organized labor? You know, it's a relationship that we're building, and I think we're partly building it around um, green jobs. I think increasingly I've heard some encouraging um, rhetoric from labor unions where they're starting to, to recognize the important role that green jobs is going to play in the future. And let me give you one concrete example of that. So I look at a state like Ohio, which has a manufacturing base not that dissimilar from Ontario. And um, I look at a place like Toledo, which has been hurt very much by, by what's happening in the auto sector. As a matter of fact, it used to be the glass-making capital of North America. They're reinventing themselves to be the, the Solar Valley and actually converting. There's a number of companies there starting to convert factories into producing glass for solar panels. 
That's the kind of manufacturing conversion I would like to see us start happening in Ontario so we can be a leader in the emerging green economy. Okay, follow my logic on this. This is going to take a bit sure. of time here. The Greens, you've told us once already today, like more local autonomy. They like more local decision making. They like municipalities to have the authority to make decisions for their communities and not necessarily all the power concentrated at Queen's Park. There are a lot of people in Northern Ontario who agree with that and who would like to have the power, the local authority, to cut down a lot more trees and mine a lot more rock. How can you enforce a green agenda if you decentralize that kind of power? You know what, I think what we need in communities like that is working with communities to talk about how we diversify the economy. So, you know, you're probably familiar with Forest Stewardship Council certified mm -hmm. paper products and lumber products and things like that. So products like that are actually higher value in the marketplace. So we can be working with communities in Northern Ontario to sustainably harvest forest products. And I would like to see us working with those communities to talk about how more of the value added um, profits stay within those communities instead of them taking raw commodities, shipping them to Southern Ontario or shipping them outside of the country and most of the value and most of the profits and most of the money actually leaving those communities. Okay, but that sounds like a 20, 25 year project. In the, in the immediate run, we, we did a program about this a couple of weeks ago. The folks up there want the right to make their own decisions and cut down more trees if they want and mine more, you know, whatever, diamonds, gold, mm -hmm. nickel, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think they probably don't want a bunch of, uh, you know, supply your own adjective here, folks right. down at Queen's Park in Toronto telling them what they can and can't do. Sounds to me like you are saying those practices are inconsistent with a green economy and we're not going to let you do it. We're not saying we're not going to let you do it. What we're saying is, is one, our green tax program would create incentives to reward businesses and to reward individuals and to reward communities for moving in a more sustainable green direction. And so that way then you, then you create the rules of the game so people make decisions and want to make decisions and are rewarded for making, for making decisions to go green. And I also think something like you know, FSC certified products, I mean, there's supply chains you know, all over the place. I mean, you, know, you can't go, you even go into you know, major uh, home building supply units now and they have FSC certified products. Those products carry a premium price in the marketplace and I think working with communities to help them move in a direction where they can use sustainable practices, get rewarded in the marketplace for sustainable practices, and keep more money in their community isn't, isn't saying we're imposing decisions on you. It's saying we're working with you as a partner to help you become more prosperous. Okay. Let's uh, finish up on the personal and the political here. Uh, you've told us earlier you've been a small businessman for much of your life, and I wonder whether you are concerned that the language of incentivizing business and looking out for the interests of small business and that kind of thing that you've talked to us mm -hmm. about already today, uh, whether that may alienate some of the more traditional base of the Green Party, which frankly doesn't come from there, but comes from a different place, mm -hmm. ideologically, politically, emotionally, intellectually, all mm -hmm. that stuff. Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Uh, if you look at the Green Party's foundational principles, so much of them have been about um, decentralization, supporting local economies, supporting family farms, like that's really been the foundation of what the Green Party has grown out of. And I think most Green Party members, and I think an increasing number of Ontarians recognize the important role that small and medium-sized businesses and family farms play in our economy. About 65% of Ontarians are employed in small, small businesses. Um, if you look at StatsCan data, the only sector of the economy that's been growing during the recession are companies with less than 100 employees. So I think Greens recognize that that, that that sector is an important part of building a sustainable local economy and building strong, sustainable communities. And I mean, if you look at a number of our candidates in the 2007 election, for instance, a lot of them uh, were green business owners. Mm -hmm. Do you? Do you worry that you are merely, I mean, obviously in, in our first past the post system, mm -hmm. the more parties that run, uh, the, the tougher it is for the second, third, and fourth place parties to get votes. W would the green agenda be better advanced by your casting your lot with one of the parties, you'll forgive me for putting it this way, that has a genuine shot to form the next government of Ontario, as opposed to creating your own separate movement that even on a great day, still might not want a seat? Well, I think it's important for us to have a green voice at Queen's Park. You know, we're polling at 10% plus of the population. 
Um, and even, even without a seat right now, I see the Green Party influencing public policy. I mean, I think the Green Energy Act is an example of, of the electorate pushing the government, but pushing it from a party that at this point doesn't have a seat. Um, we've played an active role uh, on issues such as the Site 41 dump site and, and Tiny Township. I think there's a whole host of issues like that that the Green Party can be a vocal voice on influencing public policy, influencing the debate in Ontario. I mean, obviously, if we have seats in the legislature, then we'll be able to even t ramp that up in a more vocal way. If a big part of the problem for both the environment and sustainability is mass consumerism, can a business approach, which again, you've told us that's your background, can a mm -hmm. business approach, a consumerist approach, if you like, really blaze the new trail that might be required here? Um, I wouldn't say a business uh, approach is necessarily, you know, advocating mass consumerism. I mean, we all need products and services to, to live. We, you know, we need to buy food, you know, we need to heat our homes, you know, we need to clothe ourselves. We need to outfit our homes. Um, there are services, you know, that we all like and enjoy, haircuts and, and you know, massages and health care and a whole range of, of economic activities that are sustainable. Um, businesses can engage in practices that um, are, you know, that, that are profitable and good for the environment. So I think it's a myth to suggest that somehow the economy and the environment are in conflict with each other. And I know that's, you know, that's sort of a way a lot of people have thought in the past, but I think moving forward, we're gonna recognize how important prosperity, economy, and environment come together. And if I could just give a personal story on that is as somebody who grew up on a farm where healthy soil is such an important part of maintaining your prosperity. And when you're in an occupation that is so influenced by the weather and the environment around you, you really start to recognize how important a healthy environment is to your own personal and community prosperity. Which politician most influenced you? Wow, that's a tough question. <laughs> uh, you know, one of the politicians who, who influenced me quite a, quite a bit was uh, Tommy Douglas. And part of it is, is, you know, is I grew up on the prairies on a little farm and just saw what somebody who was just passionately believed in, in, in an issue, in his case, health care, how it could really change the agenda, change the debate, and, and made Canada a much better country, I think. Okay, and I think I can be passionate like that about the environment. And there's something about coming from the prairies and coming from a small community like that that um, connects you to a community and connects you to a passionate issue. Now, I know you're not a Republican, but being from Kansas, I thought for sure you're going to say Bob Dole or somebody like that, or Nancy <laughs> Kassebaum or Alf Landon or something. No. no? No, no, Bob Dole, actually, his hometown was very close to my hometown. Yeah. Uh, but um, no, I actually think, think uh, there's, a, there's, been other, there's been other prairie politicians who, who have influenced me. I'm surprised to hear you say a Canadian politician, though, given that you, know, you spent most of your life down there. Well, it's about half and half at this point. I've spent the first uh, 25 years of my life in the U.S. and the last 15 years of my life here. Gotcha. How do you like Twitter? I like Twitter, and I notice you're on Twitter quite a bit. Yeah, you, you tweet from question period, right? Uh, yes, I do. Well, I don't actually not during question period because right now I'm in the gallery and I can't take a Blackberry with me into the gallery. Mm -hmm. But as soon as question period's over, uh, I like to send a tweet about what I'm talking about or what I think's happening that day that's important. You got any followers? I have a lot of followers. Go ahead. Hundreds. Hundreds? Oh, hundreds. I think about in Twitter, I think around 285 the last time I looked. Okay, good <laughs> I'm on not, you. Not, not as many as you have, Steve. Good idea. Well, I'm, uh, this is not a competition. <laughs> don't worry. Um, there's a by election coming up in Toronto Center soon. Yes. You going to run there? I don't think I'll be personally running there, but I'm sure we're going to have a very strong candidate. We've already had some uh, people express interest in being our candidate in Toronto Centre. And as leader of the party, I'm going to be working really hard for whoever our candidate is. And one last question. I asked this of Elizabeth May when she was on this program for the first time, mm -hmm. and she surprised me with her answer. What's your favorite color? Green, of course. <laughs> All she, my children know that, too. <laughs> she didn't say that. She said blue. Blue. Well, blue is a lovely color, too. That's my second favorite color. Okay, good. Because well, you don't want to be too offside from the federal party, right? That's right. We don't I want understand. to be too offside, yeah, for sure. Mike, we thank you for coming into the studio tonight. You are the new leader of the Green Party of Ontario, and we'll see you on the hustings along the way. Thanks Absolutely. so much. Absolutely. It's a pleasure.